terrific idea for your Five, birthday party. Four, if it's three, your idea, two. it's going to involve boys. Of course it involves boys. Bunch of girls singing at the party. Up in, with the world, in the world of, of okay. uh, the real world of make it or break it television right. series, ah. how important is that first episode or two? Well, unfortunately, it becomes more important every day. The way things are going now, uh, you know, they're going to start pulling shows at the act break if they don't get ratings. At the what? At the act break. After mm. the first 15 minutes, if the ratings <laughs> aren't up, I'm afraid they're going to start pulling our show off us. Second team, please, on to the market. Well, there are so many critics of television, of what we have on television, yeah. that it's low quality, it's lowest common denominator. If that's true, if some of that criticism is true, who's to blame? Is the networks demanding a lower standard, or is the lower standard being provided by the producers? I think it's a system that we're all seduced into, and some of us try to break that system. Great moments, coming at you. Great moments, bound to catch you. Great moments, when you're on CBS. Come on along with ABC. We're reaching out, it's you and me. Come on along, come on along with ABC. Just watch us. There has to be something wrong with a business that spends so many millions of dollars in the area of development and creates so little acceptable product. There's got to be something wrong with us. If the system hasn't worked and the audience is leaving us, and this is true about any industry or anything, if you have a marriage that doesn't work, you try to fix it. If you have kids, that you're having problems with, you try to do new things. This has been rotten for the last 10 years. Why don't we fix it? You stay for dinner? The audience shares are eroding. The network structure, as we know it, is in jeopardy. In the next hour, we'll try to give you a glimpse of how primetime television works. We all may be familiar with the visible players, the Lavernes and Shirleys, the different strokes, and the different folks of Dallas. But how do they get there? Who created them? Who dictates the television we watch? Or more to the point, the television that fewer people are watching. This free television, if you don't count the stress of sitting through the commercials. It may be free to us as viewers, but to the industry, it is a $10 billion honeypot. To give you an idea of what's involved here, each year, the three networks combined spend over $100 million to develop series, most of which never get on the air. And because the stakes are so high, the pressure to get big ratings and thus big profits can leave the question of excellence somewhere on the cutting room floor. An ancient conflict, really, between quality and profit. Tonight, we put faces to the executives at two of the three networks, NBC and CBS. ABC was not interested in going along with this enterprise. But it's fair to say that the ABC story is not too much different from the other two. These network executives are not the stars in your living room like Hawkeye or Magnum P.I. They are real people, really real people, the stars of the network boardrooms. And what they're saying to you is, don't touch that dial. We'll begin, as they say, right after this message. It happens every spring high up in the towers of CBS, NBC, and ABC. What we are watching is selling week, the week of weeks. In great secrecy, executives are deciding what each of their fall schedules will consist of. Their decisions will make grown men weep in agony or joy. Those grown men are the producers. The networks do not make their own shows, apart from news and sports. They contract them out to the producers, who gather around these rites of spring like so many hopeful virgins. Up in exotic suites of the Waldorf and other grand hotels, the producers are playing make-believe with the three primetime schedules while they nervously wait for the networks to call. Gary Nardino, the president of Paramount Television, is a man with a golden touch. He's touched such little beauties as Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. 
Nardino and his Someone lieutenants are trying to outguess network strategists. Sunday, boom, with, with little darlings. Scamps and little darlings. I think they're crazy if they get rid of that show. The word yeah. on the street is CBS, there's uh, some internal discussion about breaking up their Sunday night comedy block. Be crazy. And maybe moving one or two of them into Wednesday. They're trying to figure out ABC. Television is a Byzantine business. For Nardino is not really a producer. He, Paramount, hires producers, then sells their ideas to the networks. We have a lot of shows on that board, fellas. Too many. Uh, you fellas want anything? Yeah, I do, Gary. We have a great fruit, two eggs over easy with sausage, home wheat toast, sanka, uh, two cups of coffee, two large orange juices, and a large apple. I think Maverick is very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Maverick sounds vulnerable. Oh, should we wake Goldberg up and dial eight and one? I know. Uh, this is extension 3023. And the producer whose idea he has just sold to NBC is Gary Goldberg. The idea is a show called Family Ties. Hi, is your dad home? This is Gary Nardino. There is no feeling quite like getting that call that, that you, you're on, and it's official. And what was nice is that Nardino called my daughter, answered the phone, so it was all in proper perspective. You know, I was in my kitchen, I was surrounded by things I loved in case the call was going to be negative. Gary, good. I had a meeting over there this morning with Brandon, Sagansky, Littlefield, with the guys, and we're in very, very good shape. Right now they have us scheduled at the 9.30 on Wednesday. Yeah, before Quincy, after Facts of Life, which is a real good situation, I think, for us. There's one other thing. Uh, the testing came in, and there is there was some negative reaction to the way the father created a problem, stumbled around in it, and didn't come off as a very positive uh, paternal force. On the positive side, it tested the third, it was the third highest concept test they've ever had as a comedy. You know, the only shows that tested higher before it were Boomer and uh, Different Strokes, which is batting 500. They do want to have this conversation before they lock the schedule this afternoon. It's a very nervous <coughs> time for everybody, you know that. So I think we just reassure them on the on, on how you feel about the, the character on a long-term long basis. I thought it was an absolutely basis. insane question. So I, Nardino was setting me up, because he knows I'm volatile. So then I called my lawyer, and I said, would you run through one more time how much money I make, how important this is to me, and how, because I'm getting an idiot phone call coming up, and I really am not in the mood for it. And he said, he's a very wise man, and he said, you should be happy you're getting an idiot phone call. There are a lot of people in town who wish they were right now, and those idiots aren't calling them. We're discussing this the day before you're going to pick up the show, guys. There is, let's not, uh, we can't eliminate the uh, little bit of blackmail that may be a part of this. I mean, blackmail it may be, but Mr. Goldberg decided to stay where the money is. A producer is careful to not put his mouth where his money is. Dealing with network executives, Eric Severide once said, was like being nibbled to death by ducks. Brandon Tartikoff, president of NBC Entertainment, a very important duck. Network interference, I think, is, is a fact of life uh, in terms of the way the business is, is being done. I mean, we are the buyer, and they are the sellers. And I don't think any producer uh, sitting uh, at Warner Brothers or 20th Century Fox or Universal can have the knowledge and insight as to what we need for a, a given time period. If on Family Ties, uh, the producer of the show wants to do nine out of the first 13 stories that have to do with the, with the problems of the parents, then I, as a network, has to, uh, you know, I have to step in and say, wait a second, you've got teenagers watching Facts of Life, and you've got a strong women and teen audience watching Quincy, and if you do stories about the father's problems, uh, by and large, you know, you are programming against what the audience wants to see. Every show on this board is either the lead in or a lead out of another program, and it all has to be part of the grand design. A New York network's grand design can be a Hollywood producer's misery. Not even the comfort of the Helmsley Palace Hotel relieves David Gerber's tension. His show, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, is being considered for CBS's grand design. He's sweating out the decision. Gerber is a champ at sweating it out.
we here, the producers, are stashed in all kinds of hotels here at the Palace and the Sherry Netherlands and Waldorf Astoria. They're all over the place, or in their uh, offices at, at 20th Century Fox at Columbia, you know, and uh, Paramount. And they're just waiting right now, just waiting uh, for a telephone call. And they worked on these shows for a year, you know, through the scripts and the development and the casting and the shooting. Companies can be die or born uh, from an independent viewpoint, from a creative viewpoint. Uh, their ambitions and their feelings and their flexibility within the business can all be turned around in one instant and one schedule. So it's a, it's a horrifying experience, and yet it's an awesome experience. And a lot of us live through it many, many times. They still keep coming back to the well. And, they all corral this, the executives wherever they can. They try to have breakfast with them, lunches with them, and dinners. Most of the executives put on about 20 pounds in two weeks just getting right, fed by the, uh, the nervous producers. That's a redundancy, by the way. For years, that all of us, at the end of the day, just went down to a hotel. We come to 21, and we all meet here. But more deals are made here, more scheduled. Losses and wins were created in the 21. It's almost like a club for the uh, producers. I want a blood yeah, transfusion, a stomach pump, <laughs> <laughs> emergency kit. <laughs> that smiling fellow is an important duck at CBS, Vice President of Programming Harvey Shepard. This lunch is just hours away from the big announcement. The producers are feeding him as if he were a Strasbourg goose, trying to pry loose some clues about CBS's decision. Shepard is not quacking. Uh, when do you say we're going to, it's going to be announced? Uh, well, the producers will know tomorrow afternoon. That's they right. get that and call. They get that call. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and no one's nervous. <laughs> the, the call is, Dave, congratulations, yeah. you're on the air. The only problem is you're against love boats. <laughs> Mr. Shepard is like a Cheshire duck, calmly explaining how the scheduling process works without really saying anything. What happens in some of these meetings, though, is when you're scheduling. The show that's the stronger show and it's the big hit, I mean, everybody, you know, agrees on that, and it's easy to schedule that because you put it in a relatively tough time period. But does testing have a lot to do with that before you even get into it? Are we really, uh, we'll use testing as a tool, but really when we do our initial evaluation, testing does not play any role in it. Is it raucous or is it rather subdued? Or... <laughs> you got Mr. Paley in the room, it's not no, raucous, no, no, but I'll no, tell no, you that. No. <laughs> they have a schedule, but they're going over with Paley tomorrow morning. And then they'll come out tomorrow morning sometime. How does Seven Rise look? Looks pretty good, thank you. By 7 in the evening, the producers are back at 21. Still no word from CBS. Nervous producer is a redundancy. So is complaining producer. Well, you're making an 8 o'clock show, so I take out the sex, I take out the humor, I take out the action. I said they're telling that to every producer in town, you know. But the thing that I feel bad about is when you make it to their order, and then they reject you, then you feel bad. That, the network development process is a funny thing. They guide you and say, do it this way. Then when you do it, no matter what, they said that you do it red. And in that screening room, it goes up and it's red, and they say, well, I don't like red. Networks should contract with producers that they have confidence in, that they believe in the work that these people have done, and let them do it. That's it. And then judge what it is. Don't guide them. Let producers and creative people make their own mistakes because that way, maybe they'll be right half the time. If they make their mistakes, and you give them a lot of help, they may be making their mistakes and your mistakes, too. Exactly. And then it's all mistakes. That's, that's what I feel bad about. Had I failed with Modesty Blaze, I would not feel bad at all if I failed with my mistakes. You know, had I done the show I wanted to make, I'd say, and they don't buy it, i say, hey, that's the luck of the draw. But I failed by doing what they asked me to do. That's what I feel sick about. I've seen guys threaten emotionally to get out of the business and rave and ramp that we had to talk down to. Fellas on a phone call or in a restaurant getting bad news, walk out and regurgitate right there. I'm talking about tough guys that be in a business. It's, it's, I just have, some of them have blacked out sometimes uh, in their own hotel room. Uh, why do we put ourselves through it? I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's, the payoff is high. The life is exciting. The sense of achievement underlies everything. I don't hear what the cynics or the caustic people say, but when you put a show on you believe in and those people are there and you say, hey, we're on, it's a beautiful feeling. And now I'm away, uh, one hour away from getting the news myself. Uh, I don't know, I look out here and I feel, like I get a phone call and I say, top of the world, ma, <laughs> or jump, I'm not sure which. The Seven Bright thing started out 
And I was a little concerned. They said, music? And out there in the rural section, and cattle, and cowboys, and music. I said, wow, I don't think I can do this on a weekly series. I mean, I'm, I've cracked up enough squad cars and <laughs> some shootouts and squealing tires, I said, my days. But cows and cowboys, it may be something a little different. And uh, we shot it up at Murphy's, California, Northern California, right in the heart of the mother load. And they cooperated. Without their cooperation, I wouldn't have a chance. They even created an entire county fair. They came out, a thousand people at one time came out to, uh, wait a while. This may be my whole, uh, my whole life here. As you know, I'm sweating out a call with the C, if Seven Brides gets on CBS, and we're all waiting for that call. Hello? Yes? Yeah. You think we're on? You mean official call? We're on. I thought we were going to wait till 12 o'clock. 8 o'clock Wednesday? Who am I against? Brass Monkey and who else? And real people? But I made it officially? I want to call Bud. I may go up there. Oh, we'll meet you over there. Well, that's great news. That's official, huh? Okay. It'll be out at 2.30? Well, God bless. Thank you. Good news. Bye. Well, <laughs> you got it. I was wearing a shell. What happened? We pause to let Mr. Gerber collect himself. But only for a moment, there's money to be spent. Now, how many music, how many dances you want, how much music, and how much deficit? <laughs> ah? <laughs> ah, that's fantastic. Jesus, how can music? What you're going to get is Muzak. No more Jimmy Webb tone. And finer dancing goes finger shadows. We've got to cut the budget down. And everything I promise you, you can forget. All right? And, no, and instead of the whole town of Murphy's, I think I'll give you Culver City in the back lot. <laughs> hey, that's fantastic. I'm happy, too. So how did uh, Gary make out? Oh, boy. And how about Lee Rich, who I'm supposed to meet at five, or I may not? Nothing. Oh, God, what a buddy blow for him. Now, I didn't go to New York because I find that vaguely demeaning. I, actually, not so vague, you know, but you go there, and you might as well be Willie Loman bringing your, your suitcase of socks, you know, and, and everybody's there, and everybody's selling, and everybody believes that they have the best show ever done, and so all the rhetoric and all the dialogue is meaningless. Th that element of it doesn't appeal to me because I think... We get very contained here in our office. We work. It's very much our writing staff. And we lose sight of the fact that we are making product to be sold. Uh, and that, that would bring it home a little too sharply for me. Each of the characters you've met so far is important, but really only to each other. These are the true grand panjandrums of network television, the affiliates. The station owners who agree to carry a network schedule. The networks may propose, the affiliates dispose. So each spring out in California at extraordinary expense, the networks wine and dine and generally love the affiliates and their affiliated wives. Enough oysters and champagne and glitter and starlets to sink the QE2 or even the love boat, all in preparation for the presentation of the network menu. Maestro, the Peacocks. With the primetime schedule they're all talking about, the president of NBC Entertainment, Brandon Tartikoff. Thank you. Good morning. And welcome to the presentation of the NBC 1982-83 primetime schedule. When the schedule was announced in weekly variety, it was accompanied by the following headline. NBC Fall Sked, 
It's Tartikoff's baby. My first instinct was to demand blood tests. <laughs> Our 11 new contenders are all targeted for the most desirable demographics. All across the board, there is youth and excitement, fresh faces, fresh new talent, exciting new personalities. But the backbone of our success will always be series. And we've got a great one in family ties. The feeling here at the uh, Phileas Convention is very high. NBC's had its problems, and uh, I think they've faced them, and I think it's, it, we've seen improvement. Well, Family Ties is a very interesting show conceptually. I certainly hope it's a turning point for NBC. Maybe we'll take a shot at being number one. That's what we want to be, it's number one. The president of the CBS Entertainment Division, Bud Grant. In the next half hour, Harvey Shepard will introduce our 1982-83 schedule. And then you will see one of the most innovative of our new series, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. That show has music, dancing, and a cast of young talent, many of whom will be among the stars of the very near future. What, what did you think, sir, of, of uh, Seven Brides? I think it'll probably go till February. <laughs> So that says, in effect, it's a kind of a... I think it's kind of a soft show. A dog. I think it's kind of, yeah, kind of a dog. What do you think of Seven Brides? We like it. We think it'll go well. What do you think of Seven Brides? I liked it. Honest. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> what is trash on CBS? Nothing. Nothing? You didn't let me finish my, nope. the answer to your question. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think that uh, a show that is not generally perceived as quality, like the Dukes of Hazard, in that form is done exceptionally well. It is executed extremely well. Well, that's a very convoluted answer. You're saying basically this is trash, but as trash, it's done very well. I didn't say it was trash. That's you what did. you're suggesting with that answer. What I was referring to. For what to, it is, it's done well. What I was referring to is what is generally perceived by our critics as quality and what is generally not perceived as quality. What does Bud Grant think, though? Well, I think that the shows that we put on the air, I can stand behind every single one of them. In the entertainment area, what is the program you feel most proud of? Dallas. Why? It's the highest rated television series in the history of television. It provides, it has provided so much entertainment for so many people. That little plaque over there on the desk that says 53.3 was the rating that it got for the Who Shot JR episode. I am very proud that we gave so many people so much pleasure. Okay, now the directors, as soon as we make a decision about location, we have, you know, about eight guys that we're ready to start moving on right away. The latest show to join the schedule, the schedule that is permanently cast in Play-Doh, is Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. David Gerber is on his way to meet with Harvey Shepard to find out just what kind of show he really sold CBS. The nibbling begins. Where's where it going to be, down here? It's in the conference room here. Oh, right, right here. here. All right. Well, I think the key to make this uh, Seven Brides successful is getting involved with the characters, and it makes it a very fresh concept and something which is, you know, cannot really be seen on the air. We want to do the music every week. We think it's part yeah, of that yeah. caricature. The dancing may be a little bit more problem, but. I think we agree that we don't want to stop the story just to dance. I know not what we say, not at Nelson any time. Right. And that's our biggest problem. Do you mind if we'll have music every every week? But if if the story plays out and there's no room for what we call a natural aspect of dancing, that perhaps that week we might not have that. But we no, But I would. think each week we have to have at least. In other words, if we could have both music and dancing, where we can manage it, that would be the ideal. But if one week we don't have a dance number, or if we have a very modest dance number, even if it's just, you know, Adam and Hannah just dancing together. But I think we must have music every week. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's you know, a like, given, yeah. Well, the dance of uh, Hannah and Adam yeah, on, the on the porch sure. was a beautiful moment. Yes, and that had music. Really and, that's right. And, and, that also, of, uh, and that's also, that came right out of the story. Right. Yeah. OK, that was a pretty good meeting. Well, yeah, that's an great. excellent meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy yeah. it while you can. It's our first network <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Yeah, Another right. meeting. Meetings in Hollywood are the staff of life. And the meetings have a language. And the language is one clue why all television sort of looks the same. You know, we're talking about the network terms. The network has terms for what we do as, as writers to discuss uh, little, little uh, hooks, to use one of their terms. 
For instance, uh, topspin is a great network word. Uh, you said, there's not enough topspin here. And uh, we said, what are, you, what are you talking about? You know, he said, well, topspin in network terms is something that happens in the scene to propel you into the next scene. Usually someone loses a briefcase or something, you know, really exciting, and that's topspin into the next scene. Heat, heat is another great thing. Heat is tension, it's arguing, it's usually somebody calling somebody a, a fat mother, you know, or some, some great thing. That's, that's the example of heat. Pipe, well, they would say, you know, you got to lay pipe here, guys. We're, we're not dealing with uh, college people. These are a lot of pipe. Pipe is the history of every character from the moment of their birth until they stepped into that room. God forbid that, that anyone watching could give any closure to a character on their own. Then you have a blow, a hook, a button. It, for some reason in network television, no one can leave a room without a joke. I don't know how it is in your own home, but in my house, a lot of times people will just go out. But here you cannot. You must deliver a joke and leave a room. That's a, that's a blow uh, or a button. And they say, we don't like the button. Change the button, get a better blow. And the hook would be some, like a man just landed. He's from another planet. That's the hook. And then the audience is going to watch that. We have an alien in our living room. The audience is hooked. Um, you would never hear discussions along any more, uh, any deeper than that about the writing, about character development and motivation and uh, reality and truth of the moment. But you will always see a show. will always have heat, topspin, pipe, hopefully a good button and a hook, and, and a great blow. Goldberg the Maverick dismisses the networks as havens for <laughs> Philistines. Yet he accepts the Philistines' money, and that's why his show includes as many buttons and blows, hooks and pipe, as anything on television. Looking at these rep repetitive clone series, you really have to wonder, is this, is this the best that our writers and our directors and our master programmers on three great, rich, powerful networks, the best that you people can come up with? Well, you know, people constantly, or not constantly, but occasionally say to me, uh, why is television as bad as it is? Frankly, I think I'm constantly amazed that television is as good as it is. Because for us to provide, and the other two networks, the quantity of entertainment, as well as information and sports, but we're just talking entertainment at the moment, the quantity of entertainment, 22 hours for seven years, under the restrictions of time and money the television has to operate under, I think it's absolutely amazing that television is as good as it is. Now, we've asked you to come here so that you can tell us exactly what you think about the television program you're going to see. And you can tell us what you think simply by pressing a pair of buttons. The networks don't like to admit that research plays an important part in what you get to see on television, but all of them maintain large research departments, the most bizarre extension of which is this way of finding if it will play in Peoria. Honest opinion. Now, just relax and view the show. Okay, I'd like to ask you people just a few questions about the show, and I'd like to remind you that we don't have anything to do with this show. Please give us your frank and honest opinions, okay? And there may be differences. Um, okay, I'd like to start with Miss 20. Could you tell me what you thought about the show? For myself, I would watch it, because I don't go in for heavy, dramatic shows. All right, now, Miss 16, could you tell me what you thought of the show? I think it would be fine if they, with seven brothers, so give them a lot. The network is now peopled and staffed and controlled by people who only understand research. They, they can't tell you what's working and not working in your show, but they can tell you how it's skewing and uh, how it's doing bimodally and how many uh, Puerto Rican lawyers between the age of 14 and 50 are watching. There are no showmen there. There are no people who are willing to go with what they themselves feel. They are trained and conditioned and taught and actually get ahead by negating their own personal feelings and trying to trying to guess really which is all it is is a guess uh, about what this american public out there is going to want while they're about eight steps behind it now here's the thing that's really amazing is every year these guys put on 10 new shows nine of which fail based on all this research and all this money and all this millions of dollars spent on pilots where if they were just picking shows blindly out of a hat 
they would probably get the same rate of success. One of the criticisms that you hear from producers out here is that you people, the master programmers, live really isolated lives. You're buried in research, or you're buried in limousines, or you're buried in jet airplanes going from coast to coast. And you neither are you showmen, on the one hand, nor are you really in touch with ordinary people's lives and able to reflect them in the programming. Well, the few times that I'm ever in a limousine or in a jet airplane, I usually bump into one of the producers that you've just talked to. Uh, I think we are in touch with the public. I think the public tells us every single day what they're interested in, what shows they're interested in, simply by the measure of the audience. So I think that we are in touch with the public. You really think that what Bud Grant likes to put on and what people respond to by way of ratings is what they want to see? Yes. But how do you know? It's not really what Bud Grant wants to put on. It's what the public, the public in the final analysis chooses. They will either watch this program or they will not watch this program because they want to see it. CBS reports will continue. The writing, the agonizing, the casting, the selling to the network and the affiliates is over. It is time to make episodes. On the set of Family Ties, Gary Goldberg is preparing for scene one, act one. It is the nature of the television industry that it hopes for success, but it plans for failure. So even before Family Ties was shot, NBC was planning its mid-season replacements. Brandon Tartikoff, looking for a possible replacement for Family Ties, knocks around some bright ideas with Hugh Wilson, the creator of WKRP. Wilson and Goldberg have their own family ties. Both wrote for the Tony Randall show. Incest <laughs> is a way of life in Hollywood. The thing that we need is a show, however you want to build it, that can start off a time period. You know, nine o'clock? Yeah, you know, something that with, with enough of us of a concept so that when you put the promo out the first week of the shows, when you have 30 promos to say, God, I gotta watch it, it's so different. Yeah. You probably load it on domestic stuff. Mm -hmm. Stay with Another it. area, but it would have to be done real well, is the uh, is the whole White House thing, if there was a first family kind of idea. Yeah. They get this guy from Tennessee, uh, you know, somebody who has really hasn't... Uh, uh, it's Spiro and Judy Agnew. Yeah, Judy Agnew. And Judy Agnew has only been uh, his wife for, uh, you know, a couple of years. He hasn't been in office. She knows nothing about she Washington. She was a waitress in a bowling alley. Right. And suddenly... And she, and she met this guy who was a congressman, you know, from Tennessee. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they're balancing out the ticket, and this guy ends up being the vice president of the United States. Uh, so this guy is a, a kind of a senator from out of the blue that he, gets yeah, picked up just to, to balance yeah, the ticket. Just to right. balance right. the yeah. elements of other shows. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's every average American citizen in the Blair House. Outside of Johnny Carson's monologue, there's nothing on television that takes shots about politics. I think people are ready. Yeah. Uh, through the times that we're living in, to you know, to take shots. Yeah. I like that. Do you like it? No, I like it. I think it's so much fun. It looks a little staged. If you were looking for someone to blame or praise for prime time in the 80s, you need look no further than this man, Fred Silverman. In the 70s, the master programmer for CBS, NBC, and ABC. He brought us Roots and Sheriff Lobo, MASH and Super Train, the best of times and the worst of times. Fred, what's wrong with network television? <sighs> There's a, a sameness uh, about it, a sense of deja vu that uh, you know, you're seeing the same things that you've seen 10 years ago and 20 years ago. And there is uh, no sense of the pioneer spirit. In a certain way, you're responsible for that because the legacy of NBC, ABC, and CBS is Fred Silverman. Well, that's not necessarily true. The I think the legacy of uh, CBS is William Paley, who has been the continuity for many years, and the legacy of uh, ABC is Leonard Goldenson, Fred Pierce. I don't think any one man is responsible for the state of television. What is trash on television? What is trash? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess there's, uh, I could say there's good trash and there's bad trash. Well, give uh, me an example. Of the well, when Rich Man, Poor Man was on the air as a miniseries, I don't think that show would ever win a Peabody. That was good trash. It was very entertaining. Bad trash. Bad trash are just shows that uh, aren't well executed. They, uh, they aren't up to the standards of, uh, you know, what they're supposed to be. Would you call uh, Dukes of Hazard bad trash? 
No, I'd say that Dukes of Hazard in its uh, in its prime was good trash because it was uh, uh, an excellent execution of what the producers set out to do. They didn't set out to make the defenders. Isn't it a sad commentary, Fred? And you just said it that most of television is good trash. That's what it is, and that's what it's always been. And I think that the, the problem with television today is the producers and the writers and the directors have been recycled. I mean, they're recycled. They go from one failure to the other. But I'm not indicting the networks. I really am indicting the system. There are a lot of good people that are out of television right now because they've done it. You know, they do it for five or ten years and they get spent. They say, that's it. We've made a lot of money and they don't want to end up in a cemetery. And it's a very, very difficult drain. It's a very time-consuming... Uh, I had dinner last night with Danny Arnold, who did uh, Barney Miller. And he worked on that show when they were in production, 16 to 18 hours a day. He used to sleep in the office and ended up having two heart attacks. If the phone rang now and one of the three networks said, come on back, Fred, would you go? No. Why not? No. <laughs> I, uh, I had 20 years of it. I had uh, 20 years of working like Danny Arnold, 18 hours a day. You know, and I, you know, I'd like to reach 50. The thing I don't like about television is the unrelenting nature of it. This idea of having to do a show every Friday night, we would shoot every Friday night. And after about the 14th show, I mean, you're just exhausted. Sometimes you're confused which show you're working on because you're editing last week's show you're writing next week's show, and you're rewriting this week's show down on the stage. You, do you see what we have to do in five days? There's no way you can do a show in five days. We have to do a show that has to be 24 minutes and 40 seconds long. It can't be 24 minutes and 42 seconds or 28 minutes. It's got to be 24.40 every week. It has to break at, the, at, at 12 minutes with a joke. <laughs> Gary, my heart bleeds for you. OK, very quiet, please. Lots of energy, kids. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the first scene of tonight's episode of Family Time. Ready, Andy? Ready. Turn loose. Five, four, three, two. Freeze up. Talking, 92. talking. 93. Talking, talking. Q him. 220. That's okay. party. God damn it. I hope you're satisfied. Juniper, Juniper. Push Man, I don't like it. Bad news, kids. No sweets, no treats, no meats. Lots of yogurt and some stuff from Bulgaria. Come up a little, Gar. Uh, you got a kid in the it's picture there. Wide, 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 wide now, Joe. Wide, wide now. Come on out. Following down. Very nice, Joe. Let him go out of their frame. What are the stakes involved in here? Something like that? Stakes are very high, yeah. In just in doing the show, there's money to be made, I think. Uh, in terms of dollars, if you're talking, I mean, a hit television series is worth is Star Wars. It's Star Wars, it's Jaws. That's you're right. kidding. No, that's a hit television show. I would venture to say that Paramount will make more from Laverne and Shirley than uh, any of the movies they've done, for sure. I mean, it is it's huge. And so if it's Star Wars for for Paramount, it's uh, it's uh, Star Wars I for get to keep Gary Goldberg. House, yes. Well, we're partners, yeah, but I get to keep, uh, I don't have to worry about making a living, that's right. I would not have to worry. Ever, Ever. you mean? No, no. With, With one hit? One, oh, yeah, one hit. I mean, even if this just stayed on for, for two years, I'd be heading for Leisure Village, you know? I mean, I'm, look, that's where I'm looking to go, so. By most people's standards, everyone in entertainment television, except for out-of-work actors and technicians, is already in Leisure Village. The profits, once a show like MASH or Laverne and Shirley goes into syndication, are in the hundreds of millions. Every television producer always says that whatever he's doing has never been done before. But in the case of David Gerber and Seven Brides, there is a certain originality by the standards of television. New music, new choreography for each show. Thank you. One. Two. She turns her three. Left. Left. Four. He goes five. Backs up. Six. Go front. Seven. She comes eight. We go and one, two. She follows one. Push your pants. And we go together.
are you doing this for? For money. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's troubling, just watching the effort that goes into something like this, is that whether this is good quality or bad quality, everyone's breaking their necks, all these young people. And, and some guy sitting at home, all he has to do is go, <laughs> I know, that thing we face, it, I don't even like to think about it. So, you know, it, it's... There is no one from CBS here. No, no voices, no brass. They haven't, uh, they'll be up there, I guess, eventually, but none of the, you know, they really let us have our own head of steam. Because I was over at a taping last night at, at NBC, and Brandon Tartikoff was there, and there must have been, you, you couldn't spit without hitting a vice president. No, not up here. No, but that's one of the reasons I've done it up here. The hills are here and the cowboys are here. I make it tough to find a place. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I have the first team right here, please? Roger, I need you. I'm just moving. I'm just trying to get an idea, uh, not as a CBS employee, but as a yeah. reporter, how much money CBS might put into something like this. Well, let us say the average price of a series between around six fifty, six seventy five, and you're going out will be over seven hundred thousand. We'll be way over that. H.L. Mencken said that no one ever went broke underestimating the taste of the American public. That would be too sweeping and too cruel a commentary on network programming. But so much of television seems designed to glaze rather than excite our minds. It's saddening that so much hard work, so much zeal goes into making the very ordinary. But prime time is an animal that must be fed and its food of choice is convenience food. At least that's what its keepers say. Deep inside. Cut it. Very nice. Thank you. Cut. In the making of primetime television, there's still one ingredient missing. You, viewers, lots of viewers. Without you, these characters, this producer, this executive have no future. And you must watch in droves from episode one. Television demands instant success. And so predictable are you that even before a new season begins, ad agency forecasters like Bill Lynn guess with great assurance who shall live and who shall die. In the fall of 1982, approximately 23 new programs were put on the air by the three networks. Of those 23 new programs, the prediction is that 50% of them will be off the air before the end of the season. What we're doing is taking a number of different elements. Research, historical data, our own basic experience and program judgment, our knowledge of the production companies and the strengths and weaknesses of the networks. Looking at our NetPack computer forecast for Seven Brides and Family Ties, we see the following. We see that Seven Brides is going to be a, a marginal program at best, perhaps a good show in the wrong time period. Uh, start out with a reasonably acceptable 25% share, go downhill from there to the point where it probably will not be renewable uh, in the next season slightly different situation with family ties we think it's going to get about a 26 percent share of the audience unlike seven brides will be successful enough to be renewed into the next season wednesday on the premiere of seven brides for seven brothers it's, go, look out. it's a rough and stopping celebration as this high spirited family fights to save their special way of life tonight on cbs Premiere night. All that anguish and cash is imprisoned on polyester, all reduced to an $85 videotape. With a slant tip for easy control. Joe, give me a remote on 410, 411, please. Mail models, Friday at 7.30. Now, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. There's no 
turning back now. Seven Brides is off and dancing towards death or glory. Well, I'm sorry. There's nothing more I can do about it. What do you mean there's nothing more? Let's go and see the judge. This isn't helping him. Come on. See, he's the practical one. That's in San Andreas. Portrait of two men hoping for a 30 share of the audience. And we have our cow with feet and we need to get it out. I'm afraid that it has been impounded by the court. Bow, bow, bow. That's right in the town of Murphy. Good morning, bud. Here are the overnights. This is super. Yeah, very good. Yes, it's terrific. Great. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, is that going to stay on the air? I certainly hope so. But you know so. No, I don't. As we sit here right now, I cannot tell you whether Seven Brides is going to stay on. So far, the show is, is doing well. It is not an enormous hit. It is not an enormous disaster. I suppose somewhere in the murky corners of this building, they're deciding what will replace it if the decision, which I gather is going to be made any week now, uh, is to cancel the show. Well, we don't cancel shows. We just don't renew them. There's a difference. <laughs> okay. Of the 23 new shows in prime time this season, 10 already show signs of terminal illness. It's no easy thing to speak in any definitive way about this art or science or money machine that is network television. There are, thank God, no rules about what television should be like. The people who run things are not paid to put quality, whatever that is, on the air. They are paid handsomely to put success on the air, as in that 53.3 rating for Who Shot JR. When Bud Grant says that you decide on the nature of this beast, there is a certain wisdom to it. What he did not say was that fewer of you are bothering to watch, that the overall ratings for prime time are substantially lower than they were a few years ago. So you are saying something new out there. The networks know it, but so far, as we've seen in the past hour, and as you can see on any night in prime time, they've done very little about it. And if the suspense is killing you, both Family Ties on NBC and Seven Brides on CBS were renewed for the rest of this season. Providing, of course, enough of you stay around to watch. I'll never forget when I tried my first show on here. I went back to Brooklyn. I was the first time I had a producer on it, you know, one of my shows. And I'll clean this one up. But as I walked in the room, thinking a big time producer comes back to Brooklyn at this party, I never heard a voice come across the room. Hey, Goiber, how come your voice not junk on the American public? You know? <laughs> that, I think, is the malady that television's got to cure itself of. You know, it's television creating new television by writers sitting in bungalows watching old television shows. The best things on television are done by very, very good people doing what they want to do with it with the minimum of interference from outsiders. And those are the shows that will be the successful shows, because the audience is a lot smarter than uh, uh, most people think. All of a sudden, I realized 40 million people, this is going out on the network. This isn't like a, you know, a La Mirada civic show for, for 15 uh, people in your family. This is, this, a lot of people are going to see this, and uh, that's a responsibility, and it's a, and it's a privilege, and it's a real joy. And I think that's, that's, this is, a, this is better than a real job. 